you're not too late. We have this kind of assumption generated by the media that tech has solved the main problems, that a few big companies are going to be dominating what technology does for society, for politics, for communication, for commerce. But actually, we're just at the beginning. Quantum computing is in its infancy. It's going to solve problems such as drug discovery by simulating what happens when you get different molecules colliding. It's going to break encryption, but there are lots of amazing positive uses. Think of synthetic biology and bioinformatics. When you turn biology into data, we can solve all sorts of illnesses in new ways. What happens when we have endless computing power and sophisticated machine learning, once we can overcome the biases, we can rethink how we personalize education. Autonomous, safe, electric vehicles become a daily reality. And the great news is, it doesn't have to be the people who are dominating today who will lead us to the future. And I spend quite a lot of my time now with the entrepreneurs who have crazy ideas. In the last um, few days, I've spent time with people like Thomas Reardon, whose company Control Labs is building neural interfaces, trying to read the neurons as they fire and convert them into activity in the screen. In the short term, he's developed a wristband that takes the muscle signals from the nerves and turns it into activity in the machine. But if you think about it, nobody wants an interface. Why should the brain not be the direct interface. I've met entrepreneurs like the founder of this American company, Too Simple, a Chinese-American entrepreneur called Howdy, who's building autonomous trucks. This is a San Diego company. Because the regulators aren't moving as fast as the entrepreneurs, he can't test the trucks in California. He's doing them in Arizona. But it's an entrepreneur who's young, who doesn't see the limits, and who sees a real problem to solve. Human drivers, first of all, it's not much fun driving. Secondly, it's not as safe as the machine. And thirdly, people don't want to do that job. The machine will step in. I spent time with Mark Kendall, a professor based in Australia who's got more than 150 patents. And he's developing patches you wear on your skin that have thousands of micro needles, he calls them micro-wearables, that go slightly below the surface of the skin to measure initially your hydration, but then any protein activity in your blood that suggests you're going to have a heart attack in the next few hours. So I guess we have some real problems. We have a climate that's in a bit of trouble. We have inequality and flawed access to education. There are startups, this one's called Climeworks, that are trying in their own ways to capture carbon so your energy consumption can be carbon negative. There are startups with crazy ideas like Lilium in Germany to create the autonomous vertical takeoff electric jet. That can be your personal transportation device. People laughed when they launched. They've raised quite a lot of money. They're doing tests. They're planning to go to market so you could get to our land and maybe in six minutes. And the costing will be probably cheaper than the Arlander Express once you go into scale. So every week, I'm seeing entrepreneurs taking emerging tools. This is some Russian researchers at Skolkovo who took any two-dimensional image because they trained the neural network with lots of data. You can show what it would look like animated. If you want to see what the Mona Lisa would have looked like if she was on Instagram doing videos of herself, we're moving so quickly that you can't think you know where things are, where the norm is. Um, so I spent eight years running um, Wired, which is a magazine that tries to know where the world is going by talking to the people, not just the technologists and scientists, but the architects, the designers, the people creating the future business models. And I got a bit obsessed with the way some of these crazy high-risk people were thinking and the way established 
profitable, successful organizations were executing. Because there's a problem when you are at the top of your game. You don't really want to be uncomfortable, to move away from the quarter-by-quarter quarter revenue expectations. And yet, there are some pretty fundamental problems from illness to rethinking education, which has barely changed. That smart, fresh thinking, plus these democratized technology tools that are going to become everywhere a bit like electricity, that can do so. So this phrase, you're not too late, um, comes from a little essay that Kevin Kelly, the first editor of American Wired, came up with, and I think quite a lot about it. Um, because I think attitude, mindset, is all that's holding us back. We assume the people in power today know how to run the world of tomorrow. Um, and it's not true. I think it comes down to us. We just need a little bit of fresh thinking, which in general goes under this phrase, innovation. It's a bit of a cult religion innovation at the moment. Um, but I think we've got it wrong. I mean, to me, innovation is something quite simple. It's taking the tools that are available to build a future-facing set of products, set of services that people want. It's not magic. And yet, we celebrate innovation in a very misleading way. And, you know, I'm part of the problem. The media get very excited about the gimmick, the novelty, the incremental difference. Every year at the biggest tech fair in the world, the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, we always celebrate these amazing new innovations that probably the world hasn't really been clamoring for, just because it's easy to make. Um, this year at the Consumer Electronics Show, some of the amazing innovations included the connected bottle opener, so you could tell your social network each time you were having a, a new beer. And if you're the sort of person who wants to know in real time with notifications when your cat is going to the toilet, well, the LaviBot is your product. The problem is, the people building these products are not building things that are really useful. There's an amazing amount of talent in this room. Collectively, you could solve some big problems unless you're distracted by fake innovation. And Silicon Valley, we're kind of at peak incremental useless innovation in Silicon Valley. Um, we're getting quite a lot of venture capital money going into startups like Bodega, which essentially is a minibar. Or Airbnb get very excited about this innovation. They're building branded apartments. <laughs> OK. But it matters, because quite a lot of venture capital goes into some of these bullshit innovations. And that's money that couldn't go to more useful things. There was a juicing company called Juicero, who raised $120 million from some really quite big funds like Google Ventures. And they made this $700 juicing machine, which was the world's most complex juicing machine. Had Bluetooth, had sensors, was internet connected. But it would make you the perfect smoothie in the morning. You had to buy these quite expensive sachets to put in there. Um, and they were doing great until some journalists at Bloomberg, as an experiment, took the sachets and squeezed them by hand and discovered you could make just as good smoothies, but actually much quicker. And sadly, Juicero goes out of business, having burned through $120 million. And this company burned through $180 million. It's called Quirky. It goes to the crowd and says, if you have any great ideas for product innovations, we'll test them, we'll make them, you'll get a bit of reward. The um, sorts of products they put to the market included this, the smart milk jug packed with sensors that would know when your milk at home was going sour and would send you urgent notifications so you would cancel your afternoon meetings or not go on that business trip. <laughs> Sadly, Quirky too goes out of business having burned through $180 million. And even some of the companies we respect enormously have gone through the wrong kind of innovation. Do you remember in the 70s, these Amazing t-shirts that you tuck in were made by this computing company called Apple. 
every week I'm seeing new incremental iterations on things that are sold as innovation. The uh, drone business, well, there's a lot of money going into there. I saw ProDrone claiming to be the first drone with robot arms, and I'm looking for this and thinking, so is this meant to be now the way to take your kids to school? <laughs> or because there's always a dark side to tech, is this meant to be the way to abduct kids from school? And I can't tell sometimes whether something's a real innovation or just like a spurious one. I don't know if you saw this last year, the spoon did very, very well on social media. For people who can't stop their Instagram updates, who can't stop their WhatsApp messaging um, to have lunch. <laughs> and I looked at this, and I'm a journalist, so we're kind of trained to be skeptical. And I thought, this can't be... And I kind of dug, it was like a marketing agency behind it. So that kind of relieved me. Um, but then I realized, we in the West aren't anywhere near the Chinese. The Chinese are rushing ahead with these kind of not very necessary innovations. The um, health insurance products that many of us have that give you a discount if you share your accelerator, accelerometer um, movement data, um, they've solved this in China. This is an innovation. So um, I guess why am I telling you this? Because um, I didn't want to be cynical and jaded and think um, the people with the power to build the future are just doing bullshit innovation. Um, I wanted to find examples of people actually creating amazing transformations inside their teams and building for the future. So I went to about 20 countries, and I'm slightly scared to say this because Greta may come and shout at me. Um, and I kind of as a journalist, you ask around, you say, have you seen any amazing transformation inside a legacy business, inside a manufacturing business, a financial services business, where they've changed things? And it kind of took me to all sorts of places. And I learned that with the right kind of mindset, because the tech is everywhere for anybody to use, interesting things are starting to happen. I was in Dubai, where they now have a minister for artificial intelligence, I think the only minister for AI in the world, because they've realized that their legacy business is being disrupted in all sorts of ways. So how do they steer the economy of the UAE to the future? And they're thinking in quite bold and quite radical ways. They are putting KPIs at every level of government to get people to experiment. They're reaching out to startups around the world to try and get all sorts of fresh ideas, hyperloops, flying taxis there. Um, but they're also from buildings like this one, 3D printed buildings, um, trying to rethink how in the future we will want to interact with the city. So they have um, an organization called the Future Foundation, and the head of it was telling me, so when you're coming into or going out of Dubai, you have to go through the airport and most people don't like the experience of going through the airport. So why do we need the airport terminal? Why can't the whole of the city be the terminal? Because we have tech. You can just call a car on your app, the driver can scan in your passport, do the biometric check, check it's you, then drive you straight to the plane. That's actually an innovation because it saves a lot of friction. And I guess the reason this is the moment is because we're still early on a lot of these exponential growth curves. Um, and we kind of know what happens when you have a, an exponential curve. Stuff that was expensive goes free. But these curves are hitting all sorts of other sectors. This is the falling cost of battery storage for a car, which at the start of the decade was $1,000 for a kilowatt hour. Um, by the end of the decade, it's going to be about $70. So the whole idea of the government subsidizing the electric car becomes irrelevant because that curve does it. The falling cost of sequencing DNA, this is a logarithmic scale, something that at the start of the century was $100 million is now $20, $25, soon the price of a cup of coffee. This changes, I guess, not just medicine, but the way the security services track people by that tiny bit of saliva from your cup. The um, other thing that changes along similar curves is human behavior. So this is a curve from Mary Meeker's annual Internet Trends Report. This is the amount of time American adults spend every day on their screens, on their digital screens. Over the last decade, we've gone from 
2.7 hours in 2008 to nearly three times as much, 6.3 hours last year. And that kind of creeps up on you. And that's time that they're not spending talking to their colleagues or their children or their customers. That's time people are spending there. So it kind of makes you realize that any type of business, even if you don't think you're a digital business, any type of government, you need to reach people where they are. Because behavior is changing exponentially. Um, I collect these growth curves. Um, this one I think is fascinating. This is how couples have met since the 1940s. And if you look at the declining black line, that's through an introduction from the family. If you look at the declining brown line, that's through meeting at school. But look at that red curve, meeting online, which I guess a decade ago was a taboo. You wouldn't tell people if you met through a dating service, but suddenly this is the norm. Suddenly, the world's younger self-made billionaire who last week sold her for her company um, for $600 million, is transforming the makeup industry by um, seven staff, I think she has, because she outsources the manufacturing and packaging of her cosmetics to a company called Seed Beauty. She outsources the e-commerce to a company called Shopify. Her mother does the finance. She does the social media because she happens to have 175 million people that she reaches and that becomes marketing. And yet Kylie is competing with Chanel, Dior, the big companies. So the rules have changed. If you are in entertainment, in games, this has come from nowhere. Esports as not just a phenomenon, but an intense form of engagement for probably hundreds of millions of people now with real money being given as prizes. So I guess if you don't innovate, the real innovation, um, this is the risk. This is the homepage of a bank that's been annotated by CB Insights to show um, for every link on the HSBC homepage, these are some of the startups trying to eat that lunch of the bank, foreign currency transactions, business loans, insurance. And um, I could show you a different slide for all sorts of other industries, for media, for food delivery, for the travel industry. So what do you do if you are already quite successful? So the answer in a lot of cases is, we'll do the startup thing. We'll have a room somewhere with some startups. We'll call it an accelerator. We'll call it an incubator. You know, all sorts of organizations, even people who make airplanes are doing the startup thing. And often I kind of think about it and look at it and think this is theater. This is ticking the box. This is performing as if you're doing the startup thing. But of course, the core business doesn't change because business as usual pleases the shareholders every three months. And I often think when I meet executives from you know, a big manufacturing or retail or financial services company, and they talk about knowing about startups and having a head of innovation, or if they're really innovative, they give them a job title like Chief Disruptive Growth Officer or Innovation Sherpa. I often think they're kind of walking off the cliff like Wiley Coyote, who's been chased by Roadrunner. You know, keeps walking for a bit and eventually gravity takes over. So, I'm not a pessimist, I'm actually an optimist, and I actually want to share some of the good stuff that's happening that I found out from here. So I'm going to show you half a dozen lessons I learned, which I think are translatable to other industry sectors. And I think these can stimulate some proper innovation. And the first one, I guess, is not about you know, what you make, what you sell. It's why you exist. It's what you're here for because there are some real problems that governments and the existing economy haven't solved. But organizations who purposefully try and solve them can create massive economic value. Let me introduce you to Carlos Rodriguez Pastor, who's an entrepreneur in Peru. He um, was the son of the central banker of Peru, and then the military came in. They had to flee to America. They kind of lost everything. He grew up in America and then came back with his dad in the mid-90s. And they bought a little cheap bank 
and that became supermarkets, hotels. It's the biggest conglomerate now in Peru. It's called Intercorp. It's 4% of the GDP, 80,000 staff, $8 billion turnover, and they had a problem. Peru has been broken for quite a while. Of the last five presidents of Peru, they've all either gone to jail, are kind of waiting to go to jail, have taken their own lives because they thought they were going to jail. They've had 15 education ministers in the last 15 years. 30 years of terrorism, hyperinflation. Carlos Rodriguez Pastor couldn't find good enough talent to work for the company because education was failing. And he couldn't get the, com get the customers to buy better goods because they weren't rising into that middle class because they weren't educated. So he thought, this is a real problem and the government's failing. We're going to have to solve it ourselves. So they built a school. They went to the best educationists in the world. They partnered with IDEO. They went to Berkeley and Harvard and Oxford. And they thought, if you are starting from scratch now, building an online, offline, blended school system from age 3 to 18, how would you do it? And they decided it has to be for profit, because otherwise it wouldn't be sustainable, but cheap enough for the lower middle class to send their children there. It's about $120 a month. That was about four years ago. They've now got 55 schools in Peru. They're exporting them to Panama and Mexico. They're getting double the attainment test results in the annual tests. And they're creating amazingly educated kids. They don't have an MIT, a technical university in Peru, so they've started one. Healthcare is the next thing they've taken on. It's broken. They have a couple of thousand pharmacies. They're now using their knowledge to build a healthcare clinic network open to everybody. You don't have to have a lot of money. For profit, tiny bit of profit, but focused on that emerging middle class. And it's kind of transformed the perception of the company in that because they're so purpose-led, they're attracting people from other countries who want to work there. And they've even put on the home page a mission statement. It's not now a company about banking or cinemas or hotels. It's about making Peru the best place to raise a family in Latin America. Purpose leads to real transformation of value. So linked to that is don't make these new ideas somebody else's problem. Make everybody in the team responsible for thinking ahead because people at every level are seeing opportunities, are monitoring changing behavior among the customers. Hierarchies no longer work. So, Ilka Pananen, who set up probably Europe's most successful games company, Supercell, whose games you've played, um, is obsessed with, as he says, being the world's least powerful CEO. He wants to attract talented people and give them complete autonomy about how they work. Supercell is called Supercell because it's autonomous cells of between five to 18 people. I went to see the team there, and there was a guy, Jonathan Downey, who'd spent a year leading a team of 10 people working on a game that just wasn't getting the engagement when they were testing it. And so they do what they often do in the Nordics. He took the team one afternoon to have a sauna, and they got excited about other projects that they weren't yet working on. And nobody really was excited about this game. So he comes back to the office, sends an email to the whole company saying, hey, really sorry, it's cost a lot of money, I know. We're going to kill that game. And we're all going to work on other projects. And they didn't tell the boss before sending the email because he wasn't in the office that moment. But that's kind of how he wanted it. So can you find a way to empower everybody? Don't think of what you're building as a product, but if you think about it as a service, that gives you a lot more freedom to transform the value of your organization. There's a bookshop in one of the most expensive streets in London, in Mayfair, called Haywood Hill Books. It's been there since the 1930s, and clearly, it's not great now to compete with Amazon. They were losing money year after year. And then the boss, Nicky Dunn, realized we're never going to compete as experts in selling books, but what about as experts in curating books, as people who know about books? They started offering a bespoke library building service. The first customer, a wealthy Swiss lady, wanted 3,000 books on modernism for her mountain chalet. They charged her 
500,000 pounds. Then they start realizing that a lot of the people coming in from the street, they may not spend much money in the shop, but they're well-educated, they're senior in their organizations. They started thinking, why don't we do a bespoke subscription service? They have half a dozen ladies in the basement reading a couple of hundred books a year. What if they get to know your tastes and each month send you gift-wrapped a book that they've chosen for you? And they'll charge 500, 600, 700 euros each month for each year for this service. They've now got thousands of people and they're making quite a nice profit. So service rather than product. 100-year-old bank in Finland, the biggest consumer bank, Oppa, again, they realized that a lot of their revenue streams were being killed by the startups. So they thought, right, we've been here to help the Finns through difficult transitions, buying a house, starting a business, borrowing money to buy a car. If that's going to be commodified, how can we help them with a service that also sticks with our purpose? Health. Let's keep people healthy. They've built five private hospitals in Finland. The bank is performing surgery. Highly efficient. If you need a scan, you can have it that afternoon. If you need an operation, you can have it the next morning. And because they've also built a health insurance product alongside it, which is benefiting from the efficiencies, it's cheap. It's growing very fast. It's forcing the bank to rethink what its purpose is. Innovation often doesn't come from working by yourself in a silo. Building an ecosystem with mutual partners where there's benefits can be really interesting. This is Le Jun, who founded a company in Beijing that makes smartphones called Xiaomi. And he's often been accused of ripping off Apple. He once made the mistake of wearing a black turtleneck at a <laughs> keynote and using the phrase, one more thing. And I'm not going to comment on the Xiaomi stores, but they've actually got a brilliant business model. They make no margin on the phone because it's so competitive. But they've invested in hundreds of hardware startups Small investments, $100,000 typically. And they've said to them, we'll give you access to our supply chain, to our retail online and offline stores, to our 300 million customers. In exchange, we want our logo on your product and quite a lot of your profits. And the best-selling air purifier in China, the best-selling battery pack in China are Xiaomi. And it's brilliant because as they see it, if they were making these products themselves, they'd be a bureaucracy. They force the startups to know on the streets every day what the customers want, otherwise the startups will not survive. We put him on the cover of Wired actually saying it's time to copy China. So this ecosystem model, it doesn't just work for companies, by the way, it can also work for governments. In Estonia, in Tallinn, Kasper Korgis helped build up a project called e-residency, where small country of 1.3 million people, limited economic opportunity. Why don't you allow people who are not physically there to build businesses in Estonia? They talk about the borderless nation. You can go online now, spend 20 minutes filling in the form. Next week, get your digital ID card. It's brilliant. They talk about government as a platform. They want other governments now to start offering services to the e-residents. Dubai has just copied them. Last month, they launched the virtual company, where you can set up a company in Dubai, where there is zero tax for certain companies, and you don't physically need to go there. It's an ecosystem. Two more quick things I learned. If you want to innovate, don't just have people who think the same. So obviously you need gender diversity and ethnic diversity and age diversity. But cognitive diversity is one of the things that they are obsessed with at X, which is the lab, the secret lab at Google, at Alphabet, that has come up with amazing businesses like Waymo, the autonomous car business, or the balloons that float in the stratosphere and deliver internet connectivity, called Loon, they've just spun off, and the Wing, a drone delivery business, they're, they're obsessed with two things there. How you get a diverse group of people, so in a team, you don't just want the engineers and designers, you want the origami expert, you want the former ballerina, whose mindsets challenge each other, and you also want a situation of what they call psychological safety, where anybody can propose an idea and they're not going to be laughed at or mocked or shut down. Kathy Hannon was working in marketing there, and she was obsessed with carbon neutral fuel. And she'd read a report published by a professor at Xerox Park saying, in theory, you should be able to take seawater and take the carbon and hydrogen out of it and recombine them as a fuel with zero carbon. And so she went to the boss and said, look, I'm not the expert, but I'd like to pursue this as a research project. They gave her a little bit of money, a person, 
to build a team. And they make you come up with metrics at the beginning of the process called kill criteria, which if you don't make those criteria, you have to kill the project. She hired the guy from Xerox. They proved that the science worked. They made the fuel. Her kill criterion was it couldn't be more expensive than gas at the gas station. Initially, it was $1,000 a gallon. Over two years, as the team grew, they took it down to $100, $50, $15, $10. And then she goes to the boss and says, we need to kill this project. It's going to take longer, cost more to get to 4 or $5 a gallon. And the boss was surprised, but they all got a cash bonus, because that's how you encourage people to think and execute in a bold way. So they may have made a few mistakes as a consumer product. This wasn't a big success. But you know, this business alone is maybe $100 hundred billion dollar business. And finally, um, if there is a dominant way of thinking in your organization, often it helps having people who have permission to think in a radically different way. So there's three million people who work for this bureaucratic organization. The American Department of Defense is up against the startups, like ISIS, who can take a DJI drone, put a grenade on it, send it over the border to kill soldiers. And yet, the Pentagon takes years to come up with a new procurement project, and often it comes a billion dollars over budget a couple of years later, and is not what the soldiers on the ground need. Three years ago, they thought, we have to solve this. They invited a guy who swears a lot. He wears hoodies that say, hack the Pentagon. They said, Chris Lynch, he's a startup guy, come and help us build a team of 30 pirates who don't obey the rules, who get stuff done. On secondment, no more than six months a year, they can come in from the startup world. They call themselves the Rebel Alliance. Their official name is Defense Digital Service, but <laughs> their office is all Star Wars iconography. And the first thing they did was, well, the websites, the public-facing websites of the Department of Defense are vulnerable to ISIS hacking them, putting up a video of a beheading. But they've never done a bug bounty competition. They started proposing bug bounties. They were told it's illegal, you can't do that. They found a legal loophole. They did it. In 11 minutes, they found the first bugs. It's now mandatory across American government. Then they start going to the front line in the Middle East working with soldiers on the front line to hack together a radio signal jammer to pull down the ISIS drones with the grenades. Eventually, they start earning respect. Eventually, the Secretary of Defense puts them on stage with him because they're solving problems by not thinking like the dominant group. So I will leave you with, I guess, the biggest risk to this, which is human nature. And we're all a bit scared of the new, and we kind of hope it's going to go away. Um, that first time you are in the completely autonomous car, which is much safer than the human-driven car, you might be in denial. Oh, there's cars coming! Oh, oh there's cars! Oh, Bill, this, put me back for me to control it! Oh, dear Jesus! This is Bill Rimmer puts I his mum in the never. Tesla and starts ah, it to an ah. autonomous. But you know, like, two weeks later, it's just going to be another way of going to play cards with her friends. Um, so I'm going to leave you with a reminder of your flawed human nature, somebody posted on Reddit um, an interesting question. If somebody from the 1950s suddenly came back, what would be the most difficult thing to explain to them about modern life? And my favorite answer was, I have a device in my pocket capable of accessing the entirety of information known to man, and I use it to look at pictures of cats <laughs> and to get into arguments with strangers. Thank you so much. I also use my phone to take pictures of cats and get into arguments. It's a very strange. Swedish thing. Isn't it, it is, yeah. Um, I work for a purpose-driven uh, organization, the Internet Foundation, and I like the way you look at the purpose as something that can attract good people for a better cost than just making money. However, I'm also a nerd, so when I saw that juicer, I remember when that juicer came out, it had everything. It had Bluetooth, it had like special little display that showed you how the juice was coming, and it just looked like it could make amazing juice. So I was very disappointed when the juice turned out to just be, you could squeeze it out of, out of the pouch. They spent, you said they burned through $120 million. Now, would they say that all that money was for naught? Or is there some sort of benefit in burning through a lot of cash? I mean, it's got to go somewhere, right? I mean, 
surely there was something that came out of this company that will sometime in the future lead to better Jews for everybody? Moms! <laughs> Moms! We're in a world that has just good enough Jews. Yeah. <laughs> we have, you know, glaciers melting and people choking on air. These are real problems that need solving. And we just need to allocate the resources to the people who are effectively solving these problems. And I think one of the ways to do this is having conversations like people have here today, bring together people from different groups, different organizations, and get the collaboration going. Because if you have a cognitively diverse group who actually see a problem and somebody has an engineering background, somebody has a communications background, somebody else has a design background, collectively they can solve those problems. And the most exciting entrepreneurs I'm seeing are not those that are clamoring to raise the most money, they're the ones that are very disciplined and focused and measuring how they can show that there's a difference. Yeah, and when you have a purpose in mind, maybe not just bringing more Jews to more people, but something that is saving the world, is that the standard we have to apply ourselves to? Well, Does saving, every starter have to be about saving the world? No, saving the world's a kind of dismissive way of seeing it, but you know, as, as I see things, the one resource that is really finite is our time. Mm. And so, when you're 70, 80, looking back, thinking, have I used my time effectively? I mean, it's not gonna be making a laundry app. Right. It's gonna be, did I have a positive impact? And am I proud of how I use my skills to reach people and help them solve problems? And there are so many problems that we have. I'm from a country in Europe called England. And I've heard of it. My government has spent the last three years arguing about whether there's something it wants to do, but it doesn't know how to do, or whether it should do it. And meanwhile, China is building the centralized AI infrastructure and you know, leaping ahead, creating a new empire. I think there's no time to waste. And that's why I guess everybody here should kind of think, am I being the most impactful I can be with my talents, with my resources, with my um, productive years. Yeah. So a lot of people are just going to go back from this conference and now cry. and quit their jobs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Astro Teller, who runs X, the Google X, um, told me, um, it's in the book, he says he um, often speaks to groups of executives and they all get very excited about the way they would change their organization, the way they would both increase the profits of the organization but do useful things. And then he asks them, um, and do you think your bosses will let you? Anybody still got their hand up? And of course, in most cases, they won't. And then he says to them, so why are you still working there? Mm. Why not quit and do it? But then it's scary. Mm. It's scary doing something that hasn't been done. The good thing is when you're with other people who are also doing that. I mean, the startup culture is mostly slapping each other on the back, um, encouraging each other's reality distortion, and everything is fab. And, you know, a few of those people build things that are quite amazing. Yeah, but only a few. Yeah, but yeah. Darwinism, eh? Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much, David. Thank you. And uh, thank you for yes. coming to Stockholm. Thank you, David. Thanks. Yeah.